before I get started, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about consciousness and naturalism. I'll quickly define naturalism. If you've heard this, this system before, um, this, is, this does not mean just like supporting the natural world and you know, giving money to national parks. It means it's a worldview that says only the natural or material world exists. Uh, that would mean that you, know, you have mass, energy, and all those kinds of things, and they're, they're described by scientific laws, and there's nothing that's immaterial. So that means no God, no ghosts, no angels, no souls, no miracles, no gremlins, no nothing, right? So um, this is this definition I've just given you. Uh, that's, that's, some people call it naturalism. Other people will call it materialism. Occasionally, and we'll get into this, occasionally you will find people who will say that they're naturalists but not materialists, and that's confusing. Uh, so we'll talk about why that might be. Um, this is sometimes summed up by the famous Carl Sagan as the cosmos is all that is or w was or ever will be, right? Just the, the, the spatio-temporal uh, universe, and that's it. Um, I had my, had my own uh, bouts of, of dealing with and thinking about naturalism. Uh, in my first year of grad school, I've shared with some, this with some of y'all before, I had a, a bit of an existential crisis uh, where I started thinking like, well, a lot of my friends are naturalists and a lot of people who are scientists are naturalists, so what if naturalism is true? If it's true that the only things in the universe are you know, matter and energy, atoms, that sort of thing, then after you die, then you cease to exist, so there's no afterlife. It also means that the universe itself is eventually going to reach heat death, and at that point, anything of any value to anybody is going to become extinct, and, uh, and that ultimately any purpose or any values you have will all come to nothing. So that's pretty depressing, and so I, that bothered me a lot, and I thought, well, that's awful. That's terrible. I, I, oh, who would want to believe that? <gasps> and I had this moment of realization. I thought, Oh, crud. I hate the consequences of naturalism, which means that I disbelieve in it. I disbelieve naturalism. I believe in Christianity because I don't want naturalism's conclusions to be true, because I don't like them. I'm, I'm, I'm discounting naturalism out of wish fulfillment. That was what freaked me out, that idea. And I thought, crud, that means like I'm biased. I'm motivated to believe in the supernatural because uh, I want to avoid this angsty feeling and, and, uh, I'm, and I'm scared of death, right? And so there's been a lot of ink spilled on this topic. Uh, whenever I think of that word angst, I always think of this Calvin and Hobbes comic uh, where he, he, you know, he makes his typical snow sculpture, but this weird snow sculpture going, ah, like this is the kind of thing that I always think of. So um, I don't know if the rest of you all have had this. I'm making light of it, but it's really not not uh, not a light matter. If you've ever had those moments where it usually happens to me like right before I go to bed where you just can't sleep and you think like, oh my goodness, what if I cease to exist after I die and I can't do anything about it? Oh no. Like, If you've never had those freak out moments, um, you probably will at some point in your life. So I do want to talk a little bit about, about um, how did I kind of come out of that and, and what, did I, what, what kind of thought processes led me out of that. So how did I come out of this? Uh, this is not an intellectual argument necessarily, but I did... Um, this was the time where I really struggled was like January. I was living in Boston, and uh, January in Boston is a pretty cold and miserable place. But then springtime came, and things began to bloom and be beautiful. And I, I walked along the Charles River, and I thought, oh, if the universe were, it were just matter and energy and all accidental, I don't think I would expect quite this much beauty in the world. This, so that would be the beauty I see would be surprising on naturalism. And I started reading a lot of Tolkien, which also helped a lot because I thought, you know, a creative story like this. It doesn't make any sense for a beautiful creative story to exist within a universe that's devoid of purpose. It seems like the universe kind of matches Tolkien's universe to some degree with story and narrative and purpose and creativity. And so those things helped me a lot. Um, I also started to really doubt my, uh, my earlier doubts. I thought this whole idea of saying, like, you only believe in God because you're afraid, you know, th those kind of arguments that, like, you only believe X because you have motivation Y, um, those kind of arguments don't actually work that well. It doesn't require any work. You've noticed it actually skips the step of proving that X is actually false and goes straight into explaining away why you hold that belief. And so that's actually not a very intellectually rigorous thing to do. It's, a, it's kind of a universal acid. No matter what anybody believes, you could argue, oh, you have an ulterior motive for believing that. So, so ultimately, that kind of a, a thoroughgoing skepticism doesn't work super well. Um, then here's the thing that really uh, drew me out of this uh, existential crisis and, and my struggle with naturalism. As I started thinking about what are the consequences for my mind if naturalism is true? Um, if naturalism is true, uh, what can I say about my own subjective first-person experience? I trust all of you are having a subjective first-person experience right now. I, I trust you're not robots. You, you see me kind of from behind your eyes, and you have a first-person experience just like I do. I can't verify it. I can't see inside your head. You can't see inside mine. But if that, that conscious first-person experience that I have on naturalism is just biochemistry, and that's it. That's all it is. 
And my sense of rational, logical thought and argumentation, I think I'm a rational person, I believe things for good reasons, and that's also just biochemistry. Now this last point about whether our minds are reliable and whether our rationality is reliable on naturalism uh, is a talk for a different day, and I think we've actually talked about that at Ratio Christi on other nights. Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis advanced a famous argument along these lines, and uh, more recently Alvin Planting is confusingly named evolutionary argument against naturalism is also focused on that last point. So I'm going to focus on this second point about subjective first-person conscious experience um, and uh, how that, that fares under naturalism. Okay, so uh, let's do a quick test. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you a question, and I will call on you. So, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine a bizarrely colored animal, like an animal that's not normally colored that way. So I just thought of a pink monkey. Um, I want you to think of one and picture it in your mind. All right, Nathan. What'd you pick? Orange zebra. Okay, good. That's especially weird. Yeah, orange zebra. Uh, Caroline, what do you think? Orange clam. Orange is uh, orange clam. Oh, that's a that's an interesting choice. Anybody else? Nathan, what do you think? A pink bear. Okay. So I want you to think about the image. See, as you hear other people's, then the image of a pink bear, you know, pops into your mind too. So here's what I want you to think about. So I could ask, is that real? And you say, no, pink bears are not real. And that's not what I'm asking. Is the image of the pink bear real? The image, the mental image, is that real? Seems so. You can, you can see it in your mind's eye. That mental image is there. Um, now we can compare whether that mental image you have is real with whether that same image would be real if it were stored in a computer. Let's say that we have a JPEG of a pink bear and it's stored in the computer. Now the computer's off, but stored in there somewhere is the JPEG of the pink bear. Now here's the question, is that image of the pink bear real while the computer is turned off? The answer is no. Right, the computer, or even even while the computer's on, but the image is not being pulled up, the computer has little electrons and things going on. I, you can tell I don't understand how computers work, but like whatever, there's a freaking JPEG in there, right? And if you said like, aha, but I can click on it, I click on the JPEG, and it appears, but not to the computer, right? It it means it would change the pixels on some display so you can see it with your mind's eye. So the point here is that our mental images are in a very real sense real. They, they, we, we can apprehend them. We can see them from our own first-person experience. Now, if, if I were to say, think of a pink bear. Now, hold still. I'm going to put something on your head, and I'm going to look inside there, and I'm going to figure out where that image is in your brain. I may be able to poke and prod and do all kinds of things with your brain, but I'm not going to find that image. I may find little neurons associated with the image, like there's the pink neuron right there and the bear neuron over there, but I'm not actually going to find the image. That distinction between a mental event, which is you perceiving that image and the actual atoms of your brain, that distinction is important. I'll give you another example. Um, the example of subjective pain. I think most of you are too young to remember this. Is anyone familiar with this little device? What is this, what is this thing? Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi. Uh, somebody want to explain what the heck a Tamagotchi is? It's a little pet in the device. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little pet. It's just a little pixel. But, and and uh, I think, if I remember correctly, you, you have to hit a button to feed it or play with it occasionally, or else it gets lonely and sad and starving, and then at that point it will begin to whimper, and if you leave the Tamagotchi alone for long enough, it will die, right? And I can remember, I, I can't remember how old I was when these things came out. I was in middle school or something, and I remember some particularly cruel friends were like, look, I'm not feeding my Tamagotchi, look how sad it is, and we were like, dude, you have a problem. Um, <laughs> and I think maybe this one of the same people, he figured out this trick on Mario Brothers where you could, uh, this is this is original gangster, Mario Brothers, right here, um, back from the 80s. Uh, he figured out you can get 99 lives for Mario, and then he would set something heavy on the controller where Mario would run to the right and die, 98 lives, run to the right and die, 97 lives, and Mario would be sentenced to this horrible purgatory of dying over and over again. And so, um, now when we say this, we always think to this person, like, why did this occur to you? Why did, that, why did you do that? But we don't necessarily accuse that person of doing something wrong. Because we know that in reality, the Tamagotchi actually does not experience pain the way we do. Neither does Mario. If Mario experienced all the pain that's been inflicted on him over the years, he would have quite a hellacious existence indeed, right? Um, but we know that like the electrons, like there's just, just electricity, it's just electrons, just little switches flipping. No actual subjective pain is being felt the way you feel pain, right? But on naturalism, it's just neural circuitry and wires and electrons and that's it. 
So what's the real difference between you feeling pain and Mario here feeling pain? It's very difficult to elucidate what that difference is. And the, the difference, we would say, is that when you feel pain, it's not merely like, you know, I have somebody poke my hand, I have a, an electron, I have some electricity fire up a neuron to my brain and say, ow, I actually have an, a subjective inner experience of pain that, that, that causes me suffering. And I say, I don't want that. And it is different than what the Tamagotchi experiences or what Mario experiences. Even if you programmed a robot to say, ow, 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 then it doesn't matter. The robot still doesn't feel the pain the same way you do. Uh, another example I can give on the existence of mental states is what's called qualia. Um, so let me, hold on, let me check real quick. What color is that? Red. Oh, no, you're freaking me out. All right, who? All right, red and green, yes? So we all agree on that. And here's the weird thing. It is possible, so we, we say that's red because we're like, I've seen that before, it's red, and we say that's green, but it's very difficult for me to actually prove that what I see as green is the same thing you see as green. Now, we could say, like, we all agreed that it's green, but that doesn't mean that our inner subjective experience of greenness is exactly the same. There's no real way to go in and verify that. You see what I'm saying? That, that subjective first-person experience of greenness is what we call qualia. And it's something that's, that's subjective. It's felt by the inner person. It's not something you can probe um, externally through science. Um, this whole concept was uh, uh, really promoted by this guy named Thomas Nagel. Thomas Nagel is an atheistic prof uh, professor at NYU. Uh, but he's upset a lot of people by really going down this path and saying, like, I can't figure it out. I cannot figure out that quote at the beginning that I had up. That was from, from Nagel's book, Mind and Cosmos. And he wrote this very famous essay called What It's Like to Be a Bat. And the idea is similar, that you can take a bat, you can know everything there is to know about the bat uh, from the outside, but you'll never know what it is like to be a bat from the bat's perspective. Okay, and so this is one of those things that just floats around the internet, that you can't figure out what it's like to be around the bat. I'll give you one more example just to show this distinction between objective truths about a brain that you can poke and prod versus subjective truths about what someone experiences or what they know. Uh, one of the most famous examples is, uh, it's always a young woman named Mary. Mary grew up in this dark room and people really you know, limited what she could see and she'd never actually seen the color red. <coughs> However, she did get a lot of physics and optics textbooks so she knows all about the concept of color perception and how our eyes work. She knows everything there is to know about eyeballs and optics and physics and wavelengths and all those things. And then, at some age, about your age, she is taken outside and she sees, someone shows her, here's the color red, and she sees it for the first time. Now the question is, does she gain knowledge? Surely the answer is yes. Although objectively, in terms of her objective knowledge that she can share with others, the answer is no. And if she gains knowledge, but that knowledge is not objective, that means she gained subjective knowledge, something new came to her, which is the subjective first-person mental experience of experiencing redness. Does that make sense? All these illustrations from Nagel and others are intended to show you that there is a difference between mental states and objective brain states, that we, that we can't just reduce one to the other. Once you accept that, an argument naturally falls out. This is my argument, not Nagel's, although I think it matches his fairly well. So track with me. Here we go. Premise one, conscious subjective mental states exist. Okay. Fairly uncontroversial, I think. Number two, if naturalism is true and there's just matter and energy and that's it, then physical scientific laws can describe everything that exists, right? If you have Newton's laws of motion, science is complete, then whatever happens, I can, I can describe it objectively because I can describe an atom objectively and that's all there are, are atoms, okay? Number three, objective scientific studies cannot describe conscious subjective mental states. Some of these examples I give in the last few minutes are intended to prove this third premise. So if all these things are true, mental states exist, naturalism should be able to explain everything, naturalism can't explain mental states, then it would follow that naturalism is false. Okay? The reason this argument is interesting is uh, naturalists themselves are like, I don't like this argument. But they can't quite agree among themselves which, of, which premise is wrong. They're like, it's got to be wrong somewhere, but I can't decide which one. So let's go through these one by one and see if we can figure out which premise is wrong. Okay? So, uh, let's start with premise three. We'll start from the bottom. Objective scientific description cannot describe conscious subjective mental states. Um, the, almost always the response is like, but wait, 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 not all the science is in. Not all the science is in. Maybe neuroscience is, is going to get better and better, and we can stick little probes in your brain and even figure out like what you're thinking about. Because I see the pink neuron and the bear neuron light up so I can reconstruct an image of a pink bear. Um, I think to say that is to misunderstand the argument. The, the point is not that we can't, you know, 
stick wires into the brain and then get information about what's floating around, is that ultimately you can't ever figure out what it is like from the subjective first person experience what their mental inner life is like. Um, some people along these lines, they think like, oh, premise three is false. And notice it follows. If premise three is false and, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that um, we can completely describe conscious states of minds using natural science, that, then we, we could potentially describe, you know, create robots that are self-aware and have artificial intelligence. But as it stands, people have already recognized the key problem. If we ever did make a robot and we said to each other, is the robot conscious like we are? There is no good test that can, be, that can be carried out to figure out if the robot has an inner thought life like we do. The robot may do lots of different things and say, I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave, and just say all kinds of things. But there's nothing we can do to verify whether the robot has an inner thought life. We know that the Tamagotchi doesn't. We know that Mario doesn't. And we're pretty sure the robot doesn't. But there's really no way to know because we can't look inside its mind. Oh, sorry. Um, and technically, we actually don't even have the ability to do that with one another, right? However, I'm human, you're a human, so therefore I, I rationally assume like you have an inner thought life just like I do, okay? I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this idea of distinguishing mental states and brain states. When you talk about mental states, these can be beliefs, ideas, or thoughts. You can believe something that is true or false, right? You can have a false belief that there are pink bears, right? Um, and beliefs are about something. I have a belief it is about a bear, right? Uh, these are subjective. It belongs to me. It belongs to my interior thought life. However, when you think about brain states, it's just biochemistry when you're done. And so we'd say a cell is in a particular state. It's difficult to point to a, a collection of cells and say, false, right? It just is what it is. There's nothing false about it. Um, it's also difficult to point to that cell, state of cells and say, these cells are about something. We can say, I have a belief about something, but how are the cells about anything? How are they intentional? How do they have reference to something else? It doesn't really make any sense. And uh, uh, cellular behavior can be co completely described by science, so there's, they're completely objective. There's no subjective element or all, at all. And so there's this distinction between mental and brain states, and no amount of extra data is ever going to close this gap. If mental states and brain states are different, then that means we have a problem that science cannot describe conscious subjective minds on its own. Okay? Now, at this point, your average naturalist will say, look at, hold on, time out. This is not freaking fair. I can learn all you want to about the bat. But it is not fair for you to ask me, what is it like to be a bat? Chemistry and physics can't do that. It's not fair to ask objective science to describe subjective realities. But that's kind of the point. If naturalism is true, there should be no subjective experiences. So you can say it's not fair all you want, but if naturalism is true, it should be able to describe everything, and those subjective experiences aren't there. Okay, that brings us to premise two. I'm going back up. If naturalism is true, then physical scientific laws can describe all that exists. Um, this is what's called reductionism. Everything there is, everything about the computer, everything about you, everything about the lines can be reduced to atoms interacting uh, and you know, quarks and things like that, right? All the things that I never learned in high school, right? So you can say everything about you can be reduced to proteins and things of that nature. And that's reductionism. And uh, so that if uh, uh, on naturalism, reductionism follows, and so that's premise two. But um, some people are like, well, uh, now I see where you're pushing me. I really don't like this. Maybe we don't have to be reductionist. Maybe, maybe. So I know the Tamagotchi is not conscious, but if I add to the network and make it more complicated, maybe if you get a sufficiently complex neural network, then consciousness and rationality emerge. They naturally are like, wow, this thing exists, right? Now consciousness emerges and supervenes on this neural network. Um, this is the hope when people say that they believe that AI is possible. They think if we get all the wires in place and if the circuitry is as complicated as our human brain, then wah, the robot will be conscious and it won't really be that different than, than the meat computer that we have inside our head. Okay, uh, now here's the question is, what do we mean when we say words like emergent and supervene? And the answer is nobody knows. <laughs> um, most naturalists say if you go too far down this anti-reductionist road and say like there are these other things that aren't atoms, that these mental states that supervene and emerge on top of neural networks, you're kind of not a naturalist anymore at that point. So premise two is pretty, pretty rough. It's hard for a naturalist to say that premise two is false without going down this emergence kind of road. Okay, let's talk about premise one. Premise one is that conscious, subjective mental states exist. Surely this is true, right? 
We're all here right now. You're thinking thoughts. You, this has to be true. One would think. No one would doubt this. No one would say this is false. Oh, no, they actually do. Look at this. This is an article uh, written by the famous Steven Pinker. This is in Time Magazine, and the, the subheading is, You exist, right? Prove it. How 100 billion jabbering neurons create the knowledge or illusion that you're here. Now, this is downright Cartesian, right? It's going all the way back to Rene Descartes, who says, I think, therefore I am, and saying, like, actually, there is no you. There's just a bunch of jabbering neurons. Uh, but you can see, even within this little headline, they have a problem, because once they say something like illusion, like, okay, there's an illusion. Someone is being tricked. Now, who's being tricked? Hmm. It's, it's difficult to think this through. Um, this was put together memorably in, the, uh, in this comic strip. This is Daniel did it, and he says... Uh, Roses are red, violets are blue, quality don't exist, and neither do you. And so that's it. whenever I think of naturalism and consciousness, this is always the thing that comes to my mind. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of try to close this out here with an extended uh, uh, quote from Nagel. This is worth, this is uh, his kind of summary of his book that it was in the New York Times a few years ago, and it's worth reading in detail. He says, the physical sciences can describe organisms like ourselves as part of the objective spatiotemporal order, our structure and behavior in space and time, but they cannot describe the subjective experiences of such organisms or how the world appears to their different particular points of view. There can be a purely physical description of the neurophysiological processes that give rise to an experience and also the physical behavior that is typically associated with it, but such a description, however complete, will leave out the subjective essence of the experience, how it is from the point of view of its subject, without which it would not be a conscious experience at all. So the physical sciences, in spite of their extraordinary success in their own domain, necessarily leave us an important aspect of nature unexplained. Nagel then goes on. This is how he explains it, and you'll see how close this is to what we've already talked about. He says, there's two ways of resisting this conclusion, each of which has two versions. The first way is to deny that the mental is an irreducible aspect of reality by holding that the mental is just can be identified with some aspect of the physical, um, this would be to deny premise three and say science really can capture the mental. Or by denying that the mental is part of reality at all, being some kind of illusion. That's denying premise one. Or you can also deny that the mental requires a, a scientific explanation. Um, there are a number of ways to do that. The easiest way is to say it's some weird fluke where consciousness emerges out of organisms at some point by accident. That would be to deny premise two. And there is one final option. We can believe that it has an explanation, but not one that belongs to science, but to theology. So there you go. This is coming from someone who is not a Christian. Now you may say, all right, Nagel, what do you believe? And uh, Nagel's beliefs are a little strange. He thinks like, we need to redo science to where it's not just chemistry and physics, but mind itself is a part of the natural order. And you're like, well, that's, that's, it's either Platonic or I don't, Lebowski, I don't know. That's really strange, you know. So anyway, um, I do want to include some rebuttals. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are naturalists and I ask them, how do you respond to this? And I will tell you, they feel extreme discomfort in denying any of the premises, uh, but they do respond in the following way. They would say, well, fine, if you don't believe in naturalism, then what do you believe in? Substance dualism. Now we're back to the soul idea. You have a physical body and an immaterial soul. Um, but that seems complicated, right? Why do I need to posit this immaterial soul? That seems, that seems messy. Um, and what's extra messy is to how to think, how does that immaterial soul affect your physical brain, right? Science is good. Science is, is good at describing how biochemistry works. So is there something interrupting the biochemistry? Is your soul interrupting and messing with the science with a million miracles a second, changing what's going on inside your brain? Seems like that would violate the laws of thermodynamics, right? Where energy is some, suddenly being injected into the system by this immaterial soul that is actually making decisions. Um, I put a few different models of how this can work on the bottom here. So interaction, interactionist dualism, this is the idea that you have a soul, is I have a physical state, this interacts with the mental state, mental state makes a decision, which, inter which affects the physical state. The criticism of this is this, this one above, that it may violate physical scientific laws. Epiphenomenalism is one of the emergent attempts. It's the idea that you really are just physical, but there's this mental state. It doesn't have any causal power, but you do have a mental consciousness which is affected one way, one way, by what happens at the physical level. So you may think that you have a mental thought life, but it's all just like things that are kind of emerging out of the physical interactions. And then non-reductive physicalism is another variety of that where like the physical interactions in your brain and the mental processes that you have are kind of happening at the same time. But all these versions have troubles, right? Because they can't explain what on earth this mental state actually is on naturalism. The other argument that naturalists will make is that uh, mental events and physical events in your brain seem to be correlated. There are some very extreme examples where people have had brain damage and it really 
changes their own mental life, changes their um, their personality, makes them prone to do horrible things, right? And so it seems like you mess with the brain, you mess with the mind, and so the two are pretty tightly coupled. Um, similarly, uh, there's this question of what about what about animals? Some animals, like the mosquito, we say, yeah, let's kill it. Uh, and other animals, like this little cute fennec fox, we're like, no, don't kill it, right? Yeah, it's, 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 we think we attribute a little more soulishness uh, to the fox, probably because we, it seems more like us. It has little eyes and looks cute at us and all those kinds of things, right? But uh, on, uh, from a naturalistic point of view, it's, it's hard to imagine. Like, why would you create this arbitrary line and say, mosquito, no so for you, fox, maybe you do. Or maybe it's just humans. Again, if we're all just organisms, why would some organisms have this immaterial soul quality and others would not? Um, okay, I have more slides, but I think it's 9-11 right now. And uh, the other slides I can get into a little more how this affects your view of ethics. But I think it would be worthwhile for me to stop. I've kind of put the question out there and the argument out there. And it's good to, to have some questions and have you push back one way or the other on this. Okay, go ahead. Hello? Can you reiterate why you believe that it is necessary for science to be able to explain subjective experience or be able to relate subjective experience in scientific terms? And also, maybe I'm misquoting one of your slides, but I think you said something about within, if naturalism is true, then that necessitates a, a lack of subjective experiences yeah. occurring. Could you reiterate? Right. Could yes. you say why that is the sure. case? Uh, it goes with the definition of naturalism. Um, the definition I gave is if naturalism, if naturalism is true, then there's atoms interacting, physical laws, and that's it. And those, in principle, should be describable using objective, outside scientific descriptions alone. And if, if subjective experience can't be described in that way, then there's a problem. Uh, so do you see what I'm saying? On naturalism, there's atoms, and that's it. There's nothing about the atoms that can't be described using objective scientific laws, so therefore the subjective shouldn't exist. Are we, are we miscommunicating somewhere? Uh, yeah. Maybe. I mean, what if we had a, you know, a conceivable machine where we tell somebody, think of a pink bear, and it shows in that instant where they do the exact on or off orientation of every single neuron in the brain. I, I feel like that's the most that we could ever ask of science. This is the exact, uh, I don't remember exactly, the, this, your distinction between mental state and right, neural Right, right. So we, the, we already have that machine. It's called a computer, right? We can tell the computer, like, pink bear, go, and or tell Siri that, and Siri will pull up the pink bear. Um, but in the computer's case, like, we don't think that there is an inner thought life, and we're fine with that. We say the computer has no inner subjective thought life. There's nothing subjective about it. I understand the computer 100%. But with the human, we get the human in there. We ask them to think of the pink bear. We put the electrodes in their, in their brain. We see the pink bear. But we still know we're missing something. We're missing their subjective experience from their perspective. Yeah, but I'd, I would also agree that if we were to create a computer a neural network, which one for one match the uh, connectiveness of a brain, if that's even uh, conceivable, then we would be just un we would know just as much about their ability to have subjective experience as we are able to another human being. So that, that's actually kind of the point. We don't know that about other human beings. We really only know it about ourselves. Yeah. We really only know it about ourselves. And if we look at the computer, we say, I know everything there is to know about the computer. Computer, I lack, I lack no knowledge of you. And then I put the human being and I say the same thing as I say it. I know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong because I, that, that human being has a subjective inner thought life that my scientific objective description misses. It doesn't capture it. There's something that's different about the human than there is in the computer. And the belief that the computer has an inner subjective thought life is a, is a mere uh, uh, extrapolation based on our own, just like I extrapolate another, about another human based mm -hmm. on my own experience, we would be extrapolating about the computer the same way based on our own inner, inner, inner thought life. I don't disagree with you. What's the implications of that? Uh, it, mean, oh, it means that naturalism is missing something about the human. There's some aspect of the human, that subjective inner thought life. Naturalism can't describe it, and yet it exists. But if naturalism is true, it should be able to describe everything. Therefore, naturalism is false. <laughs> so I guess I mean, if, I if, 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 you're if you're struggling, I, I guess you'd need I, to think. I'm struggling with the idea that our yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so w which premise are you uncomfortable that, with? I guess that our subjective experience, like I think a pink bear, the idea that that actually exists as anything more than a, um, 
kind of an illusion fostered around just physical brain states that it's anything more than that is where I would oh, disagree I, with Oh, I agree. You. It's nothing more than that, but it, it is that. The computer doesn't have that. That mental image of the pink bear, the computer doesn't have that. How can you know that? Uh, I mean, the Tamagotchi, does the Tamagotchi have it? Well, Tamagotchi's not as complex as a Ah, brain. see, that's the point, though. It's very difficult to say but it's Tamagotchi not arbitrary. Does, uh, no, this is the point. The, Tamagot the computer is nothing more than a series of Tamagotchis. Yeah. It, is, it, is, it is mere speculation to, to say that if I get enough Tamagotchis together, then suddenly it will have consciousness. We have no way of, of verifying that that's true and no reason to believe it's true. I mean, if we can equate a... a What's the like most basic computer component? That's like a transistor or yeah. something? Yeah. If, if we can just, if, if we're justifying and relating a transistor to a neuron, then I don't see why not. And so I that's the, like that's are. the point. Like let's say let's say we match it up. You can't have it both ways. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, uh, if if we say that this this human being, yeah, I think you're ha trying to have it both ways. You're both trying to have it that the, we completely understand everything about the computer, but there's also something once it matches the human that we don't understand about the computer, which is that it's that which is its subjective inner thought life. It can't be both. The reason a naturalist would say, "I know everything about the computer," but then if, as soon as you say it has this inner subjective thought life, you don't know everything about the computer anymore. So it's got to be one or the other. I guess maybe I'm denying in what way subjective experience exists as... You're experiencing it right now. We all are. That sounds like premise one. I guess it is in the same way. Prim premise one to me is by far the most painful to deny. I'll think more about yeah. what my definition of exists. Yeah. I'll let Alex yeah. not push Sure. It. I'm not a naturalist, but I'm still not 100% certain on... Uh, Premise three, because three? Yeah. yeah, because we could have a point in the future where, quote unquote, plugging wires into somebody's brain could give us a sort of a video feed or something. Yeah, video feed of their in, of what their neurons are doing. Yeah. So, how can you claim that it's a hundred percent true? So even in that case, you are it would be you, you seeing the video feed, but you are not experiencing it from their point of view. This is this is actually the point of Nagel's. Nagel's argument about the bat. Even if you can like figure out absolutely everything there is to know about the bat, including a video feed of like what kind of thoughts are occurring to the to the bat, what the bat's visual visual field is or audio field is, you're still not experiencing it from the bat's perspective, from that subjective for, uh, uh, first person experience of the bat. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Thanks. Uh, hi, I have a question about this syllogism. Mm -hmm. So even if you grant that all of the premises are true, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that there's a problem between premise two and three. And yep. it's that in premise two, you're essentially saying if naturalism is true, then all physical knowledge, I mean, sorry, all uh, physical scientific laws can describe everything in principle, mm -hmm. right? In premise three, you're saying that objective scientific studies cannot do this in practice. So no, uh, I actually, yeah, I, that's an important point. Premise three is objective scientific studies cannot in principle. How can you know that? Because it's not a data problem. Even, even if, be, because uh, the, uh, 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 the it's basically the issue is the words objective and subjective. No matter how good your instruments get, no matter how much data they can get, it's still objective. It's never subjective. Okay. Thank you. Uh, regarding one of the later on slides, sure. uh, mentioned Cartesian dualism and yeah, uh, that sort of thing. This is the part that's less comfortable for the for the Christian, for sure. Yeah. So, um, what properties would this supposed non-material thing, substance, have? And uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, this is one of those things that, like, if you say, well, what are, what are its properties? Let's study it scientifically. Oh, crud, we can't, <laughs> right? So, so, uh, so people have, have struggled. But, I mean, this is much of the history of philosophy, right? You go back and read Plato, and Plato talks about, like, well, let's see. I think I have an immaterial soul because I can reason things out and I have a moral sense. And he, he goes off and talks about why he believes that his, immor his immaterial soul will persist after, you know, after he dies. That's why he's, Socrates is... Uh, 
sorry, I said Plato. Plato writing about Socrates, right? Socrates is confident to drink the hemlock and die because he's done all this reasoning about what this immaterial soul is like. So, I mean, the answer to your question is like, people don't know. They've been arguing about it for a, for a long time. Um, you'd have to say that it's, it's uh, that people usually attribute things to this like, Concepts like free will, concepts like rationality, concepts, concepts like uh, moral properties that it, can, that it apprehends moral truths, things like that. Um, for a Christian, making statements about the immaterial soul become a little bit easier because we, we appeal to divine revelation, that we know something about the soul, that our souls did not pre-exist, that they're created in a certain point in time. And it, that also helps to, to figure out this problem of like, well, if there's an immaterial soul that's not spatially located, why is it connected to a particular body that is spatially located? Um, all those things would have to be connected with some sort of theistic purpose, right? So I agree, it's messy. Um, and as a, as a, as a Christian, I, I feel like we would be speculating just like Plato if we didn't have some source of divine revelation on this point. Yeah. So I have a uh question uh so related to the question about the mosquito uh the monkey and and the human thing yeah it seems to me that you might be able to uh it, for for someone who's a materialist but uh like a non-reductionist they might be able to make a i guess a principled argument to the effect of if you start all the way down with viruses you know that they're they don't live or anything like sure. that um so we know viruses are the tamagotchis of the right of natural, yeah gotcha. <laughs> yeah yeah right. and and so we know for a fact that they don't even have the basic fundamentals for life, like they're just machines. Sure. Then you can move up to something slightly more complex, like say, um, like a, some type of bacteria, like E. coli. Sure. So now you've, you've made a change, a, a very small one, from non-living thing to living thing. But you still know for a fact there's no, there, there's no reason to think there's anything spooky or any ghosts going on. Right, there. right. Uh, then you can move up to the mosquito, and then you can move up to, say, a fish, and you can keep going all the way up the chain of life and asking this question, is there some type of qualia that this organic being has that might uh, naturalism might have a problem with? And it seems to me like if you say no, 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 and there's a very like gradual increment in the complexity of life, it seems like you might be able to make a principled argument that as things get more physically complex organically, then they also seem to be more complex behaviorally. Like mosquitoes and foxes actually have very different uh, sure. things. So it seems to me that you could go one of two ways. You can either say that uh, there's some type of spook that's going on outside um, that somehow more complicated organic beings are able to interface with that. Or you can say, I'm a materialist, and all of these things materialism can explain, but it's just right here that our assumptions start to break down, and we might need to bring in more material assumptions. In that case, it's not, it's not ad hoc. You're not just saying, ah, well, you know, science doesn't know. You're saying that uh, our understanding of the physical world just starts to break down right here. And you could draw many analogies to that, whether it's something like um, like biological tissues being mechanically characterized or even like, say, um, with uh, cosmology, with the Big Bang, you don't go back to a point. You go back to an area where our science breaks down. But in all those points, it seems like you're still, I guess, warranted in thinking there may be something more there. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I think like, you're, you're kind of creeping up on Nagel's view itself. Um, so Nagel, Nagel says, the materialist who says there's atoms and that's freaking it, can mm -hmm. never get out of this jam because atoms are, in principle, fully describable by object objective science. Nagel says, I know from my own first-person experience that there is such a thing as mind, that there is such a thing as consciousness, and our physics and chemistry uh, uh, current view of science can't hack it. So that mm -hmm. means we need to change our view of science. That's what Nagel argues. He says our view mm -hmm. of science has to change to encompass a concept like, like a mind. So Nagel is one of the few people out there, he will say that he is a naturalist, but he is not a materialist. Okay. He says, if you're a materialist, then you're stuck with the there's only atoms problem. So he doesn't believe in God for various other reasons. And so he says, I'm a naturalist. I believe there are atoms and also that mind itself is a property of the universe, but that should be understandable and studyable. And there's probably some way to make peace between Nagel and the anti-reductionist emergent whatever people. But, I mean, to me, like... You're, it's borders on mysticism, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, a, yeah. it's, you know, whatever this n stuff that's not atoms, it, it sounds, you know, sounds pretty spooky to use your word. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. So a question I'm having is with uh, premise three. Mm -hmm. When um, you talked about that science uh, cannot describe conscious subjective mental states. 
Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, closer to the microphone. There you go. Uh, so the the question I'm having is, I know somewhere in the slides you mentioned that you know maybe we couldn't expect science to be able to do that. You know, right. That's common. Well, maybe the issue is that it has. It's more of just we can't expect science to be able to communicate that. Mm. But mm -hmm. we actually are getting all the information there. So, like, for instance, if someone made a perfect clone of me, I put it over there and I look at that. Presumably, if it was exactly the same, it would also have the same first-order mental consciousness states that I do. And mm -hmm. they could maybe be the exact same. If we were, you know, exact clone and we were both thinking about the pink bear, they would be the exact same. All the data is there, but you can't communicate that to me exactly just because a virtue of just it's still different spatially you know it's if i have adam a and i have adam b they can be exactly the same but by virtue of having two things there is at least one property that's different yeah i think i understand what you mean it, it almost sounds like you're saying I, sci I, science can get it done it just can't communicate what it's found to the scientist yeah maybe i do have all the data i just can't communicate to you in a way that would give you that same yeah, I, I've, that, that objection came up with Nagel itself. Like na People responded to Nagel and say, I know everything about there is to, bat, to be a bat, but you can't expect science to put me with my subjective self like in the bat <laughs> to understand what it's like to be a bat. That's a, that's a ridiculous thing to expect science to be able to do. But Nagel kind of goes back to, I mean, <laughs> effectively that's more of an argument against premise two, mm. not premise three, because uh, Nagel... Oh, oh, yeah, I meant Right, no, I mean, this is a, this is a common issue. Nagel saying... If naturalism is true, then there's atoms, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And we really should be able to describe all of it using science and understand it. You know, just same way, the same way that we understand mm -hmm. everything there is to know about the Tamagotchi, there should be no difference between the Tamagotchi and a person. But we know that there is. Yeah, I think, I think my problem is, is just that any way that you would try to describe it would, e even if you can make an exact replica of right. a person, by virtue of it being a replica, you have two people. So there's at least one property, sure, the sure, spatial sure. property, that's different there. Right. So, I mean, so if, if I had it exactly the same, it would just be me, and I have that experience already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Um, and again, Nagel would respond like, it does seem unreasonable. It seems unreasonable to ask science to do this. Mm -hmm. But on naturalism... Science should be able to pull it all. I, so, so the point is to push back on naturalism and say, naturalism, why are you this worldview that tells me that I can describe everything? Hmm. On naturalism, there shouldn't be any of these subjective states that escape science. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to close with da, 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 an interesting little thought experiment. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story and then we'll be done. Here we go. Uh, I heard this on Radio Lab. It's a great little podcast if you want to listen to it. There's this guy named Kevin. This is a true story. A guy named Kevin, uh, he was living in this town, working at this job, and he began to have, he, had, he struggled with seizures most of his life. And at one point, he actually had a seizure while he was driving. Had a wreck. And the one, part of what the doctors told him is like, all right, this is bad. By the way, do not drive anymore because you're going to get yourself killed or somebody else killed. So he uh, begins getting a ride to work with this, uh, this young lady about his age. And one thing happens after another, and they fall in love and they get married. Everything's good, right? She still drives into work. He doesn't drive. But his seizures get steadily worse and worse. So he uh, goes to, they go to the doctor, and the doctors say, all right, there is a risky procedure we can carry out. Um, we're gonna actually have to remove part of your brain. I know that sounds like it would kill you or be bad, but this this should solve the seizure problem. And it's been tried before, it should be okay. And Kevin and his wife are like, oh, I don't know. Oh, okay, let's do it. So they do it, they do the procedure, part of his brain is removed, he comes out of it, seems everything's okay, seizure stop, everything's all right. Um, but his wife in the months following began to notice some kind of oddball things about Kevin. Uh, she um, noticed that he got a little OCD about certain things, like he would play the same little tune on the piano for like hours at a time. He started having some kind of weird sexual behavior like toward her and like weird, right? So she was like, yeah, you're still Kevin, but like something's off here. And then one day uh, she gets a knock on the door. She goes to the front door. She opens it up and there are federal agents at her door. And she's like, what the heck is this? And her husband comes downstairs and he says, I, I know what this is about. I'll come with you. And she's like, what? What are you talking about? He goes in. It turns out they are arresting him for, ch for possession of child pornography. So it turns out what he'd been doing was downloading child pornography, deleting it, downloading it, deleting it on his computer. And they're like, there's laws against this. You can't do this. You're going to jail. And so 
Kevin's defense attorney said, like, look, he was doing this as part of this OCD behavior. He just had this surgery. Clearly, this is like some kind of biochemical problem with his brain. Um, and you can't just say that he chose to do this and deserves to go to jail. Let's just sentence him to house arrest with no computer. How about that? And the prosecution was like, no, absolutely not. He knew what he was doing. And they actually got the doctor who performed the surgery who came in and said, well, I kind of didn't tell Kevin and his wife about this, but they have done surgeries like this on monkeys before where they've removed this part of the brain. And some of those monkeys like really did act out sexually after the surgery. So yeah, this really may be like a biochemical problem caused by the surgery. And the prosecution said, oh, that's a very interesting theory. Um, I have a question for you. Why doesn't he have any of this on his work computer? It's only on his home computer if he can't control it. And the judge is like, hmm. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to split the difference. And he split, and he sentenced him to two and a half years in jail, two and a half years of home house arrest, where, you know, split the difference between the two. And the, part of the judge's argument, he didn't use these words, but I thought, eh, Kevin's kind of like a werewolf, right? Like if he has certain moments where he really can't control himself, um, he needs to let somebody know, right, that he has this problem so he'll be prevented from, from doing this bad thing. That's what I would do if I was a werewolf. I'd be like, look, full moon, like lock me up, okay? So, um... So in some sense, Kevin seems like he is still partially responsible, even though he has these moments where he's not totally in control. Are you all with me so far? Okay. Now here is, so it's uncomfortable situation across the board. Uh, but on Radio Lab, they had this guy come in. Uh, he's an expert on criminal law and psychology. And here's what the guy said. He said, you know, if this had been, this happened in 2013. If this happened in 1993, we wouldn't really have the technology or medical knowledge to know that there was something wrong with Kevin's brain. So he just goes to jail. 2013, we can actually do imaging and see, yeah, there's something wrong with his brain. We know he had the surgery. We know it has these effects. So we do know he's something that is wrong with his brain. So maybe he doesn't deserve to go to jail. Now, this, this uh, criminologist is a naturalist. He says, ultimately, in the future, in 2033, um, we can, the imaging, the technology will be even better. And we can see what's going on with every criminal's brain. And we find out that every last criminal act is associated with some kind of brain state. And so instead of saying, they're guilty, they're naughty, they're bad, we say, like, something's off with your brain, just like Kevin. Something is off with your brain, and that's what caused you to do this bad thing. And so we can actually change uh, maybe what, what, uh, what we should do. Instead of sending you to jail, we need to get you treatment because you're more like a broken computer than a, than a, than a, a bad person. Um, <clears throat> the problem with that is uh, you may get into this situation. Oh, sorry. Um, so if... In 2013, jail, uh, Kevin doesn't go to jail, but he gets treatment. And in 2033, the criminals don't get jail. All the criminals don't get jail. They get treatment because it's just a problem with their brain, and they're not really in control of what they do because they're just a brain, right? Then in 2034, they say, hey, I have an idea. I'm going to scan Bra Zach's brain. And even though Zach hasn't done anything bad yet, he does have some criminalish elements in his brain. So he's also broken. So it's treatment for him too. Okay. The reason this particular podcast episode is so gripping is the radio lab hosts, who are both naturalists, this is the point where they begin to feel supremely uncomfortable with their own naturalism because they were like, that's wrong. It's wrong to try to send people to treatment if they haven't done anything wrong. But if you're a naturalist, there is no mind beyond just what the brain is. And so things like we are responsible for our actions. And there's more to me than just a brain. It's very difficult to hold on to if you're a naturalist. So this is not just a theoretical question about what you believe. It actually impacts your view of ethics very strongly. And these two different views of ethics and, and criminal justice system are still competing within our universities today. Yep. Well, and who decides what a criminal working brain is? Because it could be the ones, the people that are looking at it. Right, this is f fraught with problems, I agree. <laughs> This sounds like Minority Report, like, you were going to do, you, you were going to commit a crime, I know it, you know, that sort of thing. So, all right, it is 9.35, so I think I've gone past my time. Um, I'm happy to stick around and talk more. Um, th I will tell you, this is one of those topics, it's not one of the ones where you hear it the first time and you're like, got it, no problem. It's, it tends to be one of those ones where you're like, I have to agonize and think about this for, uh, you know, a year or so and, and, and before you really start to come to it. I will tell you, for me, when I was dealing with those kind of angsty moments of like, oh, what happens after I die? One of the things that kind of came down here, I'll just end with this. One of the things that, this is kind of where I landed. I thought, all right, that whole, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, quality don't exist, and neither do you. Um, Dan Daniel Dennett syllogism. I thought, like, okay, if the naturalists are right, and I don't survive my death, I'm just a biochemical soup. Who cares? The reason people get angsty is they feel like I am a 
conscious, living agent who has value. So how can I be extinct after I die? But on naturalism, a lot of those descriptions of a conscious, moral agent with value, it's kind of hard to hold to that. Yeah, you're just a biochemical soup. There's not even really a you. So you can rest easy. And this also kind of made me start thinking like, if I'm just a biochemical soup, why, why am I listening to myself, right? And so you got into the, the whole problem with like on naturalism, figuring out like where does rationality come from is also an issue. And it really, anyway, this two or three arguments related to this really kind of brought me out of my funk and didn't make me feel so angsty anymore. And I think that's worth something. Okay, thanks guys, appreciate it.